make cool stuff. Uh, I'm going to do a part two to my first supercharger video just talking about eating superchargers with a few things I wouldn't say I necessarily miss, but I'll talk about a few more things. And I also want to make a correction uh, to some information I provided on the first video. Uh, uh, thank you very much to the, the viewer who, uh, who corrected me on, on uh, a mistake I'd made, and that was that uh, the Thunderbird supercharger, this guy here, Super Coupe Supercharger is in fact an M90, not an M62. So uh, kind of a good news, bad things. Bad, bad that I made the mistake and, and actually produced a video with that, that error in it. Good news for me because an M90 is much more useful to me than an M62 is. I, I only have Crown Vicks and M90s are work okay on a Crown Vic. It's, uh, an M90 is, is maybe useful up to about a 5 liter engine or thereabouts. Anything bigger than that you really want to look at a, a bigger supercharger. So yeah, I might be able to use this on a future project. So uh, it, it's it's actually there's some some good differences here to talk about, and I guess the big difference here is just the size of the housing uh, between the Thunderbird, which uh, has a, a much small. I don't not sure which which of these two interfaces are the ones that actually marry the thing up. I think it's probably the the maybe these two bolts here. Don't know. I've never saw it installed. I just picked them up as as loose parts. So uh, that that is worth considering if you're say perhaps doing a side mounted air um, supercharger installation uh, these the Buick unit here was a like a top mount sort of fed right into the uh, the intake of the car um, you can see it's a much much larger housing now that said I don't see any problem with actually cutting it down to the same size as this guy here I'm sure it could be done I there's I've already drilled into on other projects I've drilled into the, the material here there's lots of meat there you could certainly drill and tap that and mount it exactly the same way as this one's mounted. So if you like this, this way of doing it, I see no issues at all with, it, with cutting this one back. Take the, the ears, the mounting ears right off the thing. Cut the back off if you don't want that either and I'm sure you can make it work. Now the snout is also shorter on the T-Bird by about an inch or so. And the T-Bird uh, Super Coupe Supercharger also has an, uh, uh, um, included, if this is the correct one, I don't know that it is necessarily, but it's got this eight rib pulley on it. It's a nice small one, which is useful because, you know, for say a big engine, you're gonna wanna spin that supercharger faster than say the Buick one did. You can actually see there's quite a, quite a size difference between the, the two pulleys. And it's, it's, it's easier to work with the supercharger side pulley than it is the crank pulley. I think I mentioned that before. Another thing uh, I wanted to mention as well was if you're buying a supercharger, it is worth getting any of the parts that are, that adjoin the supercharger or, or interface with the supercharger. Uh, because you, to sometimes to have to, to fabricate that stuff after the fact is, is expensive. So in, in, in the case of this guy here, so this is, this is the, uh, the T-Bird one, it's got this kind of oval uh, intake, which is on the, uh, on, the, on the back side of the supercharger here. And that would be kind of a, a pain to have to fabricate. So you could, you could buy the, or get this part here, cut it, as you see fit and, and perhaps make it work or not. Um, the part that was also quite useful, and I couldn't find it, I've got two of them, but I, there's the, the outlet manifold on, uh, for this guy as well. And as I said, I couldn't find it. Garage is a mess, couldn't find it. So uh, anyway, that's, that's worth picking up if you're buying these things as well. So wasn't so useful on the Buick side. There wasn't really anything there. And of course it's, uh, I had to, to make this thing work, I had to cut a, a, a quite a bit of the supercharger off. And, and somebody did, did t uh, ask me a question on um, the first video about where where do you cut the supercharger? How's that done? Could you show a video of that? Well, I'm not gonna show a video of it because it's it's a big deal to cut this thing up. So it, it's, a big, it's a big deal if you've got no use for the supercharger after you've cut it up. Anyway, it's not that hard to do it. So uh, you, what you wanna look for, if you, you can see it through the other side here, is you'll see the two uh, bosses for the bearings and you wanna, you wanna cut it just after the boss. So, so you leave the bearings intact. Now the back bearings are already lube for life with grease in them, so you know, there's no oil feed to them, so you know, just don't nick the bearing and you'll be okay. Uh, it would be, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do that, now you don't, you don't have to dismantle the supercharger, just make sure you vacuum the whole thing out, like really, really, you know, carefully with a, with a strong shop vac to make sure there's no particles left in there. Or you could dismantle the thing, just put, uh, if, you, if you pull the snout off, uh, there's oil on there, really stinky oil. Um, I, I, I can tell you the very first time I, I picked up one of these things from the, uh, the auto wrecker, I thought I'd stepped in, you know, dog, dog poo, you know? So it was, that, that's what, that's what supercharger, used supercharger oil smells like. There's an additive in there that just reeks. And I thought, what the hell, where's, where's this smell coming from? Anyway, 
you want to dispose of that oil and you probably want to replace it anyway. If you're picking up a used supercharger, it's, it's not cheap stuff. Like it's probably going to cost you 25 bucks to recharge the supercharger, but it's worth it. You know, it's just a little bit of a little bit of a caution there when you're, you're putting the thing together. Why not? You know? Um, so yeah, so you want you, the adjoining parts, the, inter, the, any of the in, uh, interfacing parts of the supercharger are worth picking up. So I know I, I, this winter I picked up the GT500, uh, Shelby GT500 supercharger, and I just went to buy the supercharger, and the guy says, oh, do you want to buy the, the intake and the throttle body? And yes, it's, you know, I, it's going to save me a lot of trouble to use that stuff, because, yeah, it's a special throttle body. It's like a, a, um, a two um, inlets, a throttle body. It's uh, something that would cost me money to go and, you know, pick one up and then fabricate to, to, to make the thing work. So I can use that just the way it is. So uh, on a future Crown Vic project. So anyway, uh, as I say, this these these superchargers are good for, I'm going to say, a five liter engine. I would not try to use one on anything bigger than that because it's just not going to be able to deliver the air you want. So that'd be an M90. Probably not, don't go any bigger than a five liter engine though. It works pretty good on a 4.6, but that's about it. So, okay, I'm going to talk a bit more about just you know, specking your superchargers and, and, and things to think about when you're when you're putting your supercharger installation together. Uh, something you need to consider is parasitic loss. Now, something like these, I think when the there there are there are diagrams online and, and uh, there's data showing what what the actual uh, horsepower to drive one of these guys is, and I think like for 10 psi at how many RPM I can't recall. It was about 50 horsepower, and I'm overdriving mine. So let's, I'm probably, it's probably taking me about 75 horsepower at at my peak RPM, let's say 6,000 RPM, to, to drive this thing. And that's, that that horsepower is not going to your wheels, but you still have to size your fuel system to include that that 75 horsepower. So if you're if you're trying to account for the, for the parasitic loss you're going to see, you're going to have to size your fuel system for the total amount of horsepower you're using. And that was, let's say you're making 400 at the crank, 320 at the wheel, something like that. Um, you're actually probably, in, in the case of my car, I'm probably making 475, you know, is what the engine's actually having to produce to make that 400 at the crank. So I need to size my fuel system for 475 horsepower. In fact, you have to size it a bit bigger than that anyway compared to naturally aspirated because you're, you're running a richer mixture, like one whole point uh, uh, richer. So if you're running, say, 12 and a half air fuel ratio on a normally aspirated uh, build, you would probably want to run something like 11 and a half. Uh, air fuel ratio. So you're, yes, you're dumping a lot more fuel in, and of course the fuel system has to be sized to accommodate that. So that's uh, that's something you want to think about. And it's also it's also when you're when you're building a car, and and I actually want to produce a video on this, and I'm, I'll just tell you right now, I uh, sort of bang for your buck, and what makes sense dollars wise when you're when you're modifying your car. And I, I've my car, I've done a lot of modifications. I've had the car for like five or six years now. It's a Crown Vic, and, and you know I've run all kinds of different, uh, or not all kinds, but let's say four different uh, engine uh, configurations, all with the stock block. And it's worth considering, you know, what what you want to spend your dollars on. I mean, I, I have a an engineering uh, background, and you know, no one, no, you would never be a hero if you designed something that was more expensive than it needed to be. So I always, I always like to think of of these things in terms of of bang for the buck. And you know, most guys, unless you're building a race car, yeah, you have a budget and you don't want to, you don't want to spend money needlessly on stuff. So there are certain things that make sense and there are certain things that just don't make sense. So, uh, stay tuned for a video on that. Um, and while I'm at it, please like, and subscribe. I'm, I, I could talk about cars all day long because I, I put a lot of thought into it. As I say, I've got an engineering background, so I have a, a certain way of looking at these things. Uh, and although I have an engineering background at the same time, I'm not a particularly good fabricator. So uh, I always have to, for my, myself in particular, I have to dumb everything down so that I can build it. Um, and I, I don't like to build things that uh, necessarily would be require, you know, hard to get parts and things like that. So I like to build things where I can just go to the hardware store and, and pick up what I need and do it that way. So uh, the other thing you want to think about too with superchargers is do you have any future upgrades uh, planned for the car and what sort of you know, there's no such thing as too much horsepower, but yeah, sure, there certainly is too much horsepower with regards to the budget. And sort of once you get past the point that your rotating assembly can't take it anymore, and these can be quite, 
quite low on some cars. Uh, there's, it's, it's a fairly well-known fact that uh, five-liter Mustangs, the block can split apart around 500 horsepower. So if, you, if I was to take a five-liter Mustang, bolt an M90 onto it, so at that point I'm, make, I'm making, say, 425, let's say, at the crank. I'm probably using 75 horsepower to drive the supercharger. I'm at 500 horsepower. I might split the crank. I'm right at the point where I might split, not split the crank, but split the, uh, the case, the, the uh, crank case. So worth considering about where you're going to be power-wise and what the limits are of your rotating assembly before you get too far, far along. Now, if you, if you put a large supercharger on your car, then you maybe need, uh, or, or it, and you don't need all the power that it can put, you can put a smaller, a smaller pulley on it and underdrive it, so to speak, so that it, uh, you know, you're producing less horsepower and then you'll have room for future upgrades if you ever do go and do something about the block to reinforce it or upsize your fuel system, you'll have extra extra supercharger there when you when you want to use it. So it's worth considering future upgrades, it's worth considering what, what the block can take, it's worth also considering how much you want to spend on, on your on your car. And I, I, I could do a whole, whole video on that and I, I think I will. Um, so upcoming videos are going to be, I'm going to talk about tuning, I'm going to do two tuning videos. I'm actually working on the tuning video right now, it's, it's the, the hardest part of the whole installation is tuning, so it's, I'm going to talk about whether you want to pay somebody to do it, if you want to do it yourself, different strategies there. I'm going to talk, do another video on tuning nightmares, and I, I've got a few to talk, talk, talk about. I spent money on stuff and really it's, it went really, really badly in some cases. So. Uh, that's why I tune them myself now because it went badly a number of times. So uh, I'm also planning on doing. It's, I've, I had a few requests for uh, a test drive video of, of the Crown Vic, and I, I plan to do that probably this this summer sometime. I've, I've currently got a fuel injector problem that uh, I'm I have to resolve. I, I, I have a good idea what it is. So uh, <laughs> uh, because it's happened before. So. Anyway, it's not related to the supercharger installation. It's re related to a broken wire for an injector. Uh, I also, uh, as I say, yeah, the other thing I'd like to do is talk about bang for buck with, with engine mods and car modifications because, you know, I've kind of learned a lot over the last five, six years about what things, what things were worth spending money on and what things really weren't spending money on. And, and I spent a lot on the car. I, 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 Hesitate to say I've probably spent, you know, well, I have spent too much on it. I've, I've got probably $21,000, $22,000 Canadian in a car that I'd be lucky to get five or six grand for because Crown Vicks just simply are not the kind of car people run out and buy, you know, uh, for, as a performance platform. Uh, so anyway, but there were certain things I could have done it a lot cheaper, and I'll tell you how I would have done it if I had to do it over. So uh, admittedly, a lot of that $21,000, $22,000 was labor because I, I was working at the time and didn't have a, a, a reasonable place to do mods. So, uh, and there's certain things I just won't do myself. I won't, I don't like crawling underneath cars and, you know, getting crap in my face. I do it if I have to, but, um, like say taking a transmission out of a car, that's just not a fun job to do in your driveway. So I will pay somebody to do that one every single time. Uh, there's also certain jobs I can tell you you want to avoid on, on cars where you expect bolts to break. Uh, bolts break, well, your, your, your modifications just got a whole lot diff more difficult at that point in time if you start breaking bolts, and especially if you break a stud off in the engine. Uh, well, uh, it's, that's, that's the kind of thing you can kind of expect on an older car. Certainly up here in Canada, damn near everything's very rusty. So, you know, even a car that's got only, only four or five years on it, it's... It's seen a lot of salt and a lot of corrosion, and it's going to be brutal to take just about every single bolt off. I can, I can tell you my, uh, the Crown Vic, when I was taking the engine in and out three times, uh, <laughs> I, uh, the very first time I'd take it, I, I decided to take the, just the engine out for, for some good reasons and leave the transmission in the car. So I had to go get in there and take all the bolts out. It took me two days to get the bolts out that uh, bolt the bell housing up to the uh, to the or the transmission up to the uh, engine every single bolt was first of all hard to get a wrench in there hard to really get much leverage and i was probably turning those bolts maybe a sixteenth of a turn at a time just like eh, 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 and it took forever it took me two days to get those bolts out once they were out and they'd been turned once while well, the next engine change went really fast so uh yeah, just horror stories of doing mods um Anyway, I'll leave it there for now, uh, but you can look forward to, let's say, the test drive video pretty soon, working on the supercharger note video, and I'll get to it when I get to it. Thanks. Uh, uh, please like and subscribe.